start by thanking everybody for coming. So my name is Hilary Henninger. I'm the Events and Communications Coordinator for CAN. So this is our Computational Neuroscience Summer Speaker Series. So we really appreciate everybody joining us today. Um, we've had a really good response. We know summer is a hard time to get everybody on board. So we really appreciate everybody joining us. We also have um, Dr. Archer Lusak next week. Um, if you haven't purchased your ticket for that yet, please do so after this. Um, but first, I would just like to give you a few reminders. So obviously, your microphones will be muted. Um, the presentation will be about 30 minutes, but we'll have a break in between. So we'll have about 20 minutes for the presentation to begin, and then we'll take a question and answer period, and then we'll do another Q&A period um, after the next section of her presentation. So it would be really helpful if you could use um, the chat function. So I will just update that, asking you guys to post your questions there while she goes through her presentation. Um, and then it just doesn't interrupt the flow of it. And then um, I'm happy to moderate those questions um, or to ask them individually as we go through. Uh, and then, um, yeah, so it should take about an hour in total. So as I said, if you have questions, use the chat function, um, or you can wait until the break and then you can ask your questions then. So for those of you who are not familiar with our presenter today, um, she is a current researcher and a faculty member in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Calgary, as well as a member of our CAN community here. So she received her PhD in physics, theoretical condensed matter physics in 2005, and her areas of research include theoretical condensed matter physics, nanoscience, nanotechnology, material science, complex systems, and neuromorphic systems. So her work has been published in journals such as Nature Communications and the Journal of Applied Physics, and she's currently focused on activities relating to the theoretical description of low dimensional materials for sensor applications and computational simulations of complex nanoscale networks. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Claudia Gomez Soroka today to share with us her presentation on the estimation of neural interactions and detections of cell assemblies. So please join me in welcoming her and she will now begin her presentation. Thank you, Hilary. I okay. hope everybody can hear me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I will share, start sharing my screen. I will put it in full slide mode. So I suppose everybody can see my, my slide. Uh, thank you. So let me just accommodate here a few windows away. Yes, now it's better for me. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you very much the organizers uh, for this opportunity to talk about my research in this computational neuroscience summer series of seminars. And I am here to, to talk about the interdisciplinary program I'm conducting at the University of Calgary, where we research on material innovations to produce benchmark brain spire devices. And this is the outline of my talk. I will give a brief overview of my research profile and interests. I will talk about brain-inspired systems, uh, or even using a more sci-fi term to it, neuromorphic systems, where I will give you a brief overview of the field and its challenges. And one of the challenges is, in fact, uh, the search for suitable materials that can be used in these next generation brain-inspired devices, and we are going to discuss on that. I am a computational scientist, and therefore uh, I will present some of our current simulations and models that are assisting us in answering uh, several research questions related to the field. Uh, I will present a little bit of a uh, research showcase of some venues of research that we are exploring at the moment. And finally, some uh, conclusions. 
<clears throat> so I am part of the complexity science group in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Calgary. Uh, these are my main topics of interest. And today I will focus on the last one over there on the list where we study the so-called brain-inspired systems. And my research falls in between the theory and computation because we rely a lot on computational simulations to extract results. But we also have great experimental collaborators working with us whom I will introduce at the end of the talk. And we also work with distinct materials at distinct size scales, ranging from nano to meso to macro scale and engineered functional materials. So now, brain-inspired systems. As the name indicates, uh, it is an area where we take inspiration of the brain style of processing uh, for designing uh, smarter electronics. Uh, the field also enables the other way around of study, where certain brain-inspired electronics could also, in principle, be good analogs to explain brain processing. And it is a very interdisciplinary field that relies on knowledge of multiple disciplines and research areas. And it's also uh, identified by another term, which is neuromorphic systems, which means taking the form of the brain. And the, the ambition to imitate brain analog processing has grown profoundly in the last years with numerous funding initiatives all around the globe debating over the challenges surrounding neuromorphic computing. And tech giants uh, such as IBM and Intel are already testing the neuromorphic concept in their cutting edge neuromorphic ships that they name it True North and Loihi, as I'm showing there in this slide. And just a couple of years ago, the University of Manchester has switched on the SpinAcre, the world's largest neuromorphic supercomputer capable of running robust neural models. But uh, one can ask, I mean, why bother, right? Aren't we doing just fine with the conventional technologies that we have available? Uh, to prove that we do need clever machines, uh, let's verify a particular task that our brains can perform effortless, which is image recognition. I will put it here on a slide, and at the instant you see this image, you immediately recognize that it is a stop sign. This slide here, despite it's just a silhouette, you can immediately recognize, yeah, it is an airplane. And even if I manipulate these images by rotating, adding filter effects or some disturbances, you all uh, uh, still can recognize that it is a stop sign and it is an airplane. Well, but as this study here shows, uh, certain artificial intelligences are relatively easy to fool. Examples here demonstrate uh, the failures uh, of deep learning artificial intelligence algorithms in recognizing a stop sign. And they, for instance, they just rotate it and that already caused confusion in the algorithm or even adding some blurry background onto multiple images also confuses the algorithm in distinguishing those silhouettes over there. So, and a big factor uh, on what conventional technologies stand on nowadays is the issue that the software can be brain-inspired, for instance, following artificial neural network strategies. However, the hardware is yet digital, and our brains are far from being digital. These uh, conventional microprocessors are built uh, based on the von Neumann architecture, where data is constantly shuffled back and forth 
between the CPU and the memory unit, which are physically apart. And this also consumes large amounts of energy and causing a bottleneck for this operation. These are very rigid and centralized units that can manage multiple cores. And materials that basically dominate this technology are the semiconductors, for instance, silicon. Now, a question, how a neuromorphic hardware architecture can be represented, how it would look like, especially when a contrast with the previous uh, von Neumann architecture I, I have just shown you. First of all, uh, I mean, I'm somewhat making a summary here. Uh, what types of features are we searching when we wish to build a brain-inspired hardware? Well, it should carry all these brain-like attributes I am summarizing here in this slide. It should be a platform that follows a kind of a network layout, as in a neuronal network. It should be able to perform massive parallel and in-memory processing, like not processing and memory should be done uh, uh, in the same environment. It should be reconfigurable and adaptable with task-specific connectivity. It should be also fault-tolerant and do all these things at minimal power consumption. Because, by the way, our brain is an extremely energy efficient biomachine, consuming about 20 watts of power, equivalent to a dim light bulb. And, and then the question comes back, since we are rethinking a technology, what about the materials that we are going to use that will dominate this critical technology? Will it still be the semiconductors? Yeah, curious. Uh, there are countless potential materials for neuromorphics out there, but I will show you my favorite one. Uh, they are the random nanowire networks, a class of cognitive complex materials that constitute the benchmark platforms for probing these collective features that are typical of biological neural systems, such as uh, adaptability, parallel processing and fault tolerance capabilities. And what are, I am showing there an image that in principle it looks very confusing, but those are all entangled nanowires uh, in a, uh, being captured by micro, microscopy uh, techniques. And so what are these tiny nanowires made of and what is so special about them? Well, what is special is that uh, they, they, we can use them to emulate sort of artificial synapses uh, by controlling emergent resistive switching phenomena taking place at each wire-wire junction, uh, each wire-wire contact point. Well, each nanowire is made of a core shell nanostructure that I am picturing there in the slide, meaning that it's made of a metallic core coated with an insulating layer. So then when two nanowires touch like this, uh, a metal insulating metal junction forms at their contact point. Uh, this insulating layer is, is volatile, it can break down, if the voltage drop across it exceeds a characteristic threshold voltage, which leads to the gradual growth of a conducting filament inside the junction. The effective length of, of this insulating barrier is hence reduced, and in turn, it decreases the resistance of the junction. If, uh, if one, for instance, reverse, uh, the polarity of the voltage, this filament retracts and the resistance turns to increase. And it is this resistance modulation inside these junctions that mimics synaptic efficacy, just like in neurons. And uh, how, how it would look like an experimental characterization of these materials? It looks like, as I am putting there on the left side of this slide, 
the experimental characterization of materials like these, made of numerous dynamical resistive switches, is something like that. It's uh, their voltage current characteristic depicts a hysteresis loop, which indicates tunable connectivity, tunable conductivity, and memory attributes. And conducting atomic force microscopy also demonstrates that the network can be turned on locally or at selected regions by applying voltage pulses at designated regions using a tip probe, which is the image that is shown there at the bottom left. This is all great, but how can we model such dynamical transport act activation in order to understand better what is going on inside these materials like this, in a disordered fashion. Because somehow it's everything like a black box uh, to us. Therefore, we have to come up with a picture for these main building blocks, which are the wire-wire junctions. And the first approach would be, let's make a consideration here. Let's consider that all contact points they are just mere resistors, since we are talking about conduction processes here. Well, the problem here is that we know that the IV response of a resistor is linear, it's ohmic, and its slope gives the static resistance of the junction. And we cannot emulate hysteresis response with a static conductor. So therefore, these junctions, they are better described as a dynamical passive circuit element named main resistor, which is a short for memory resistor, in which its resistance state can be controlled and trained upon repeated application of an external electrical stimulus. A main resistor uh, exhibits resistance that can change in time as this response can be controlled by defining dynamical internal state variables, that it could be, as an example, charge concentration, filament size, intensity of the input stimulus, among other uh, considerations that can be done for uh, the particular Mady-Steve model. And the mady fingerprint is a current voltage hysteresis loop as I am depicting there uh, in the slide. And think of a main resistor as an adaptable pipe, but in the context of electrical current. A main resistor would work as a pipe that adjusts its diameter in accordance to the amount of water flowing through it. And main resistors are also viewed as memory cells in which bits of information can be encoded and stored in these resistance states. And so in our studies, we target to emulate brain activity in synthetic structures like those that I just showed to you, where we can have many of these Mady-Steve units entangled in a disorganized fashion, just as in a neuronal network. And we take inspiration on machine learning methods and artificial neural networks and demonstrate that nanowire networks can exhibit a type of self-organizing learning, is a competitive kind, in which only a single conduction channel is activated upon electrical stimulus. And this is what we name winner-takes-all conduction. To demonstrate this, uh, we devised a full computational model that can simulate the, conduction, the conductance evolution of a nanowire network as those that I'm showing there in these slides, made of numerous many Steve junctions. Uh, the first stage of the model is to convert an experimental micrograph image, is shown in A, into a virtual version of the nanowire network by image processing it. All wire intersection points are identified and the network is mapped into a massive circuit network composed of numerous node voltage points and passive circuit elements. And in this case, 
wire segments only account for their static inner resistances. And therefore, they can be modeled as ordinary resistors. But the wire-wire connections, they are modeled as mainly stiff elements whose resistance will depend on the history of charge flow. And integrating these two resistance contributions within this disordered frame, which we probe with a current source, we can obtain the overall conductance behavior of the network. And this is done recursively as the current source is being ramped up in, in terms of intensity. And we look at the problem at distinct angles. We carried out experiments and computer simulations, and we compare uh, their outcomes. And we also investigated the physics behind these materials at distinct scales, meaning that we look at a single junction unit and at a network of them. At the junction level, we studied the experiments fed the simulations with information, and they pointed out that the conduction of a single nanowire junction made of distinct materials that I won't detail here, they respond as a power law uh, with the amount of current being sourced into the terminals. And we found that this exponent fluctuates around one, depending on the choice of uh, materials. And we then plug this power law model into a network and we see a phenomenon being captured by both simulations and experiments. But there you can observe that within a certain current range, the conductance of nanowire networks also scales as a power law. And this is what we refer uh, to self-similar behavior between individual junctions and networks of those junctions. But Note there in the simulation result at the bottom left of the slide uh, that after a certain threshold, the conductance in the network acquires a stepwise variation with some fine structures featuring plateaus. The good thing is that with simulations, at any stage of the simulation, we can try to visualize uh, current contour maps that depict how current is being distributed through the network and so we can explain these different stages in the conductance versus current plot that we are visualizing there. And we did that and put it in a sort of a simulation frame that you will see things moving right now on the screen. Uh, this animation will reveal that uh, during the power law regime and in the very first conductance plateau that that curve in the middle will, will depict, uh, the network uses a single conduction path to transmit nearly 100% of the source current uh, rather than spreading it into multiple paths. So think that this is a very disorganized material. In principle, you could use a whole universe of paths, but there in the current map that you are showing, that you are visualizing there in the blue sort of panel, it's self-selecting just a, a number of paths. And as current keeps increasing, secondary paths begin to emerge, bridging the left and right electrodes uh, in the simulation. And, and the panels on, on the left there with those bars, they just show, uh, they are monitoring the conductance of certain junctions in the network, and they are just switching on and off and making a way for the current to be propagated in the network. And the single uh, path state is what we call winner takes all conduction state in nanowire network systems. And it is by an intrinsic competition uh, mechanism taking place between all interconnected junctions in the network this network self-selects the least resistance path to propagate the input current. And the first conductance plateau that we observe in the curves, they correspond to a state where all junctions in the path, and for that particular simulation that I'm showing there, we inferred about seven junctions, they all have reached uh, its conductance state value, the maximum conductance state value, which in the simulation we set the quantum of conductance as a curve. 
And before I start our first uh, Q&A section, uh, just to let you know, uh, we can visualize this winner-takes-all path states also in laboratory, not only via uh, computer simulations. Uh, those panels there, A, B, C, and D, they are a direct visualization of a real winner-takes-all path in silver nanowire networks, and they were taken with a technique called passive voltage contrast measurements. And in this procedure, electrodes are grounded at selected points during a conductance versus current compliance measure. And wires that are connected to a ground electrode, uh, they appear darker, whereas floating ones, they appear brighter. And there in panel B, when there is already an amount of current flowing through, through the device, we see the emergence of the winner takes all path that can be reinforced and if we keep ramping up the current in this measurement we see secondary paths being emerged in the from the top electrodes of this sample so the next part of the talk i will sh research showcase all the topics that we are addressing in the group but i will make a quick stop now for uh, questions uh, if you wish So we have a couple of questions. Um, and what I'm actually going to do is I'm actually just going to, um, instead of asking them, I will just go directly to the individuals. So uh, Javad, if I pronounced that correctly, if you'd like to unmute your microphone, you're welcome to ask your question. Uh, hi, thank you for the uh, stimulating uh, presentation. I was wondering if it is possible to design or modify the topology of uh, non-wire networks. And if so, have you studied the electrical properties of such networks for different topologies, like free scale networks or small small world networks or so on? Uh, yeah, that is a good question. Yes, it is possible to alter the topology there, the connectivity. We are investigating also other designs and other architectures. There are experimental techniques that, for instance, you rather than a so disorganized profile as those that I am showing to you, you can apply certain techniques to align a portion of nanowires. Others can be still a little bit messy. We can patch additional electrodes onto the samples, and then we can have sections where there are electrodes in the middle of the network that would also generate other winner takes all paths. So yeah, there are numerous possibilities and we are investigating a few which I will also showcase in, in a few slides. Thank thanks you for your question, Javad. Was that it? Yeah, thanks. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna actually move on to Greg. He has a question about voltage range. Greg, would you like to ask a question? Yes, sure. I was asking what is the voltage range? range and the gradient of the resistors which you talked about? Yes, uh, the voltage range is very important uh, in, in, in the experiments and in the simulations. Usually the kind of samples we have available, we needed to scan uh, around minus 10 to plus 10 volts in order to start seeing some sort of mainly steam response that we are expecting. The resistance ranges also varies a lot. It depends on the combination of materials that we are using. And we have a number of combinations because we can have silver core coated with PVP. We can have uh, metals coated with metal oxides. So it also fluctuates a lot. Uh, for the case of uh, resistances for the silver, for instance, as a reference, it, the resistance can range from 11 ohms up to 300 ohms. Uh, a point that it's also a bit problematic in the studies and we need for the studies that it can have many defects around in this whole mesh of materials. And, and then that's why we have such a big range of resistance because you can have perfect melted junctions and you can have junctions that are really barely making any electrical contact. 
So uh, luckily, as I will show at the end, we, we have some experiment, uh, experimental data available. And most of the hints we need for these parameters we take from measurements. Thank you for your question. So we're actually going to move on to Lavanya, if I've pronounced that correctly. Um, she has two questions that she would like to ask you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, mine is more of like application-based questions. Uh, what are the other uh, area of research and neuromorphic technology apart from image recognition? This is one, one first question. And the other one is, what are your thoughts on uh, quantum technology for creating such neuromorphic network apart from the nanotechnology which is being used currently? So maybe we'll start with that first one there. So what are the other areas of research in neuromorphic technology apart from image recognition? Apart from uh, image recognition, yeah, we do have other, uh, other kind of brain-like tasks to do. Another one is associative memory, uh, processing of um, multiple inputs and outputs, uh, processing of time, uh, time dependent inputs. And uh, I will also number a few more inference. Uh, everything that is kind of brain-like operation is what we want to try to replicate with the neuromorphic. It's, it's essentially that. And I mentioned the image recognition that it's something that uh, human brains can do really well. But yeah, any sort of analog brain-like processing would be suitable for this technology. We still have many steps to accomplish there, but this is what we are hoping for. And the second question is? So the second question is, what are your thoughts on using quantum technology for creating similar neuromorphic networks? Uh, we know uh, that, especially in this kind of study that we are doing, that we study things in different scales, like just a single nanojunction and macro networks. Uh, we know that quantum effects do play a role in, in many of the mechanisms we are investigating here. And uh, it is something that we keep in mind. It's just that we always try to think of also how to scale this process. Because this is also what it happens with uh, conventional microprocessing. Uh, these technologies need to be scaled. And, but indeed, uh, when investigating the minute mechanisms taking place inside these materials, we do need to account for quantum effects. And this is not so straightforward, but computer simulations can help us a lot with that. Wonderful, thank you. So our next question, uh, we'll pass along to Karosh. If you would like yeah. to ask a question, go ahead. Uh, thanks for the nice explanation and the presentation, Claudia. So I have a very quick question. Uh, do you happen to remember, uh, for those of uh, nanofabrication materials, which one of them kept, or in other words, memorized the self-selected paths for a longer time? From the selection of materials we, we had available in laboratory, the winner was the silver uh, coated good. with PVP. And even that's why it was the most studied one in the last works we did, mm -hmm. uh, because it does occur a process inside uh, the, those wires that it's even difficult to revert. So once you sample something there, it's even difficult to erase. I would say oh. the, the silver PVP. Oh, okay. So that's good. Thank you. And our next question is actually um, from Dr. Dr. Tatsuno. So I will have Dr. Tatsuno ask his question. Hello. Hi, uh, Claudia. This is Masani. Um, thank you for the really nice, interesting talk. So the, I see uh, the uh, nice uh, property for the self-organization of the connections in the nanowire networks. And uh, I wonder um, if, if you can also have the uh, mechanisms for generating like action potential uh, in your networks? 
In, that is a very good question uh, because uh, this kind of results that I showed to you, they are nanowires that they have a more gradual response, but we do have nanowires that they respond really as an abrupt switch. Uh, after a certain voltage threshold, they really just switch it on and it almost like mimicking a spike. And this also depends on how you combine these materials to make these nanowires, but this is a, uh, this is possible. And it's a, a very interesting set of samples that uh, we would also need to investigate. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. And our last question is um, from Matthew Tata. If you would like to jump on and ask your question, that would be great. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I'm curious, if I understand correctly, you apply a constant voltage. Uh, if you were to apply a time varying voltage, would the current take different paths uh, depending on the frequency domain of that alternating current? Yes, it would. And it also depends on the history of how we are stimulating these on wires. And this is the tricky part of this research. Because at the minute we do something on them, if we apply a constant voltage, or if we apply a sinusoidal diform, or even a pulse, you already altered your system, and this is in the memory of your system. So anything we do in the past, it will affect the outcome. Uh, so if you, we previously, uh, and we do uh, different types of uh, perturbation in the nanowires, we apply pulses, we apply sinusoidal uh, kind of waveforms, we also keep voltage constant. Uh, we have to study all this, uh, this uh, universe of possibilities to see at the end what will be their outcomes. And the outcomes is they are memory dependent. So, and this is very, a very important issue that it makes this research even more long-term. Thank you. Welcome. Wonderful, thank you. So I think we're going to stop the question and answer period for now. Um, it's currently almost 1.40, so we probably are gonna move on to the next portion of the presentation and then we'll do a final Q&A at the very end there. So thank you so much for everybody's participation. I will turn it back to Claudia. Thank you. So at this part, I will mostly showcase, and it won't take too long, uh, the other, other kinds of topics being covered in our research group. Uh, the first one is about understanding neuromorphic materials at the nanoscale. And why we have to do that is because the work I have just presented to you, uh, the transport properties at the nanoscale, they were addressed phenomenologically but we wish now to treat it uh, ab initio, so to speak. So we needed to come up with theoretical models that can describe EO migration processes taking place inside the nanowires and dynamics of filament growth in wire-wire junctions. And we are already contributing in this research where we proposed an extended Mady Steve model to fit a complex hysteresis loop measure in, in one of our titanium oxide, oxide nanowires. And some of these nanowires, as I said, they have really complex behavior. And even some of the hysteresis loops, they are not so straightforward. So we wrote down a set of differential equations that could capture this complex eon, eon migration process taking place inside these nanowires. And we are also looking at this problem using bond percolation toy models that can be further tuned and review even more complex and phenomena at the nano scale. Another research venue we are pursuing concerns the investigation of optical transmittance coupled with resistance calculations in random nanowire networks of high transparency. And this is due to the fact that these materials can also serve as transparent conductors, which can be very attractive for future flexible displays technologies. And here is a summary of the kind of analysis we performed. We estimate figures of merit 
of optical transmittance versus sheet resistance in multiple nanowire network platforms. And we categorize them in terms of targeted technologies. We are testing uh, alternative ways of improving such figures of merit, which are ca categorized by maximum transparency and minimum resistance. And we also suggest novel uh, nanofabrication patterns onto these uh, new network samples. And finally, perhaps our research front runner is to advance our understanding about neuromorphic materials at the macro scale. And we needed to extend the notion of winner takes all conduction into other architectures that admit the processing of multiple inputs and multiple outputs as in a neuronal network and those that can be trained to perform uh, brain-like tasks. And even to complement one of the questions that were made, uh, here we call these multi-terminal samples that we are studying synthetic neural networks. Uh, they're the, the name of the talk. And, and our goal is to deliver a proof of concept neuromorphic device using these cognitive network materials that I won't go too much into details now, but we have scripted a series of training routines that will define protocols for these networks to perform these typical brain operations, such as inference, associative memory, pattern recognition, multisensory processing, and fault tolerance features. We are also, another question that was put in here about the topology of the network, we are also looking at the contrast between disorder network layouts and regular ones. Here on the right side of the slide, uh, we have the re realization of the so-called mainly stiff crossbar array, where wires are nanofabricated horizontally and vertically, and at each cross point, we have a mainly stiff junction. Both structures have their pros and cons, uh, in which one would serve better for undeterministic fault-tolerant kind of operations, where the others would be better, for instance, for operations that require precision or require really spatial control over the mediastive junctions. And this is the study that we are doing at the moment. We are training both layouts to perform certain brain-like operations. On the left side, we are training a disordered nonwire network to memorize several winner-takes-all states as in a multi-level memory device. And on the right side, we are uh, training a made Steve square lattice, for instance, to solve a maze problem. And this is coming, becoming a quite cool uh, project that we are uh, developing. Just to summarize, here is uh, our main strategy that I won't go into details, but the whole background of our research is divided in three stages of study, understanding, design, and knowledge transfer, and manufacturing. The understanding and design phases are mostly ruled by simulations, where we try to understand the material's property first, then we try to put it in a virtual design layout to test if those, uh, those ideas are really promising for neuromorphic, and then we transfer these instructions to our collaborators who have a laboratory and can put our ideas into, pra into practice, so to speak. And if you now really want to know about the outcomes of all this research that we are doing, especially for the neuromorphic side and all these nice network samples, I have to tell you, you have to stay tuned in the activities of our group. So, let me briefly introduce you to our neuromorphic initiative here at the University of Calgary, which we are expanding. And amazing work is being done by our small team. Also to my colleagues at the Complexity Science Group, who are also working in this neuromorphic challenge, Joran and Wilton. And to the groups at Trinity College Dublin, Ireland, that in fact, they introduced me to this field 
about six years ago. And they are the ones who provide valuable experimental data for our analysis. And here is some of the conclusions, which is just a kind of a summary and recap of many things that I have already told you. Uh, some of our last references, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, if anybody has any questions, um, Feel free to ask them right now. I didn't get any more pop up in my chat. So is there any other questions that anybody would like to ask? Uh, I would like to ask a question, please. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I was trying to compare the uh, neuromorphic chips with the conventional digital chips that we have, like microcontrollers, uh, where we can program them and make them do what we want them to do. Uh, I was wondering if there is some analogous scenario for neuromorphic chips as well that we can somehow program them. Uh, yeah, that's my question. There are studies that are probing already, and you know, I would say that one of the most fundamental kinds of operations that in fact one needs to design in order to test a capability of a processor would be testing first logical operations. And this is being done in maybe Steve cells, kind of neuromorphic uh, styles of networks. Uh, and then, yeah, how would be a simple logical operation uh, in, a, in a ship like that? What I, I like to say is that I, I, I say that it's not that neuromorphic technology will substitute completely the conventional technology. I, I, don't, I don't see this as, as uh, positive in a way. It's better to have both technologies complementing each other. The neuromorphic technology would be critical and more efficient to do certain kinds of operations while we still will stick to other kinds of operations with the conventional technology. So this is what I, I also to complement the answer to your question. I don't advocate for a complete substitution uh, they they will be more complement each other. Thanks. Are there any other questions at this time? I have one. Perfect. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, it's cool. Sorry, um, Claudia, about these uh, crossbar memory-resistive networks. Uh, they're famous of having leak in them. How big that leakage is? How does it affect the output? They are known to, to have indeed uh, current leakages. There are strategies to try to amend this. And it's all, I would say, better and better nanofabrication processes and try to, to make it the samples with minimum amount of defects or any kind of uh, potential, potential bottlenecks. Uh, but there, there are even this image that I showed here, it's one of the first realizations of the, of the crossbar arrays. Uh, the technology already, there are many works already, even more recent ones that are um, indicating big improvement on the leakage, but it's still something that they always have to look up in a, in a design like that. But then that's what I mentioned, uh, two completely contrasting to, uh, network layouts, they both have their pros and cons. And it's a measure of, uh, it's a matter of understanding these two layouts and to see which one is good for what. Thank you. And we have one more question from Greg. Hi, so uh, my question is, are there neuromorphic processes today which give better performance per watt when compared to silicon semiconductor processes? Uh, sorry, uh, the question? Are there the question. neuromorphic? Sorry, go ahead. Sure. Are there neuromorphic processes available today or in research, which gives better performance per watt 
when compared to the silicon semiconductor processes which are available? Uh, these are, uh, I would, the, there are already neuromorphic uh, chips, uh, as I mentioned in some slides in the beginning. Uh, IBM and Intel, they are investing the technology and yeah, we do have uh, kind of neuromorphic supercomputers already being operated, but I would say the technology is not yet uh, to be ready, it's not ready yet to, for us to have it in, in our homes. It's still in a kind of a proof of concept stage. Uh, and this is what research and as more knowledge will probably uh, bring this technology to something that it will be more accessible to us and not only in a research uh, a view or proof of concept uh, stage, if this answers your question. Yes, I would like to add on a question, if it's okay. Mm -hmm. And do like how do you like benchmark neuromorphic processes like conventional processes in my to a floating point operation flops per second? Are the benchmarks same for a neuromorphic processor? Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, that's why I mentioned this is a field that it's super disciplinary, interdisciplinary, and. And for instance, the stage that our group is, we are first focused in understanding the materials, uh, those that uh, demonstrate promising results that then maybe in the future, we've also helped from other uh, knowledge and experts in engineering, computer science, then we can bring this to, to a more benchmark phase. But for now, uh, we need first to select what are the best materials? What is the, the raw part of what could be uh, the final process of a neuromorphic chip? And, and yet, and for many of the stages of this research, we would count on also other levels of expertise and knowledge from other areas. Thank you. Thank so you. We're just waiting yeah. to respond to Javad. Javad has a question for you. Yeah, uh, I can see that uh, in the neuromorphic chip that you're showing on this slide, there are multiple pins, as it is the case for conventional uh, microprocessors as well. Uh, as far as I know, in conventional microprocessors, the pins are either input or output. Usually they are fixed in terms of being either input or output. Is it going to be the same on neuromorphic chips as well, where like pin one, two, three is always input and the rest are outputs? Or is it going to be used in a dynamic fashion? Some pins are sometimes input, sometimes output. Mm -hmm. That is a good question. Is it still a totally open question? Because this is, for instance, this is the layout we are studying the moment. But we needed to really remanage all those pins and put it in different positions, even sometimes uh, under the substrate as kind of bottom uh, electrode gates to investigate also the outcome of, of these uh, of the samples. This is only one of the layouts we have uh, planned. There are many others we have, in fact, to look up. And, and that is a very important question because, yeah, it will play a role and we will need to decide which ones uh, perform better and for which type of operation it will perform better. I see. So that the degrees of freedom is really huge. They are. Yes. Yes, it is. It's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. So we have about four minutes left and we're just going to move on to Lucas has a question. Go ahead, Lucas. Hi, Claudia. I was curious what the training process for these chips look like. Is it similar to backpropagation in conventional neural networks or what does the learning or training process look like on these chips? Uh, yeah, there is one type of operation that it's is similar to backpropagation, uh, especially in some cases we can 
take the output of the nanowire network and refeed as an input and keep a recursive process into it. So in many kinds of operations, they, they can perform similar uh, type of operations as, uh, as this one uh, you mentioned. And we take inspiration from all these operations to see if we can design this into our neuromorphic analogs. Okay, that's really cool, thanks. Do we have any last questions? No, I think that's it. So I just would like to take this time to um, a massive thank you to Dr. Claudia gomez Siroca for her time and her effort in this presentation today. Um, so on behalf of Campus Alberta Neuroscience, as well as the Computational Neuroscience Scientific Advisory Committee, who are both um, facilitators and sponsors of this event, we really, really appreciate all of the um, attendance, all of the active participation, uh, and the investment in this building this computational neuroscience community. If you would like to next week, we have another one with Dr. Arthur Lusak. So we will hope that we will see you there. And thank you everybody for joining and thank you again, Dr. Roca.